couple of weeks, we've been talking about the kingdom of God and how if you look throughout Scripture, you get this story that's developing about what the kingdom of God is, and it's supposed to create in us this longing for where we're going to go, where we start to see the ideals of what God intended for His creation to be and what we have to look forward to. And last week, I talked about how that's not just to give us this mentality of let's wait it out until we get there. It's supposed to create this, I just can't wait type of longing where we're saying, we need to experience that now. It's not something I want to wait on in any way. And tonight, we're going to read a passage of scripture that is entirely devoted to Jesus describing what kingdom living is supposed to look like. If we want to know what that kingdom is going to look like better, there's kind of this like swinging back and forth that we need to do where we look at what God has commanded us to be in this life and imagine what it's going to be like when it's perfected. And then we come back and we learn more about how we're supposed to live and what he's showing us about the kingdom now so that we can then look forward to when that comes in its completion. And so, tonight we're going to look at what is the most famous sermon ever preached. Anybody have a guess of what that is? <laughs> Not even close. <laughs> yeah. Any real guesses? Sermon on the Mount. Yeah it's, yeah, it's okay. Two weeks ago is maybe, you know. But. So we're going to look at the Sermon on the Mount, which is entirely about how do we live as kingdom citizens now. And so I have two books that I've started reading uh, just in studying the Sermon on the Mount. One is called Studies in the Sermon on the Mount by Dar- uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones who is a famous pastor in the 19th and 20th century. Um, it's pretty healthy. And, uh, but what was really interesting to me was as I was reading this and getting ready, I picked up this book by a, a guy that I listen to a lot of things that he produces right now. His name is Sky Jathani. And his book is called, What If Jesus Was Serious? And... It's a book that's a devotional about the Sermon on the Mount. But what struck me was that both of them, a man who was a pastor a hundred years ago and a man who's writing right now, said pretty much the same exact things in their introductions, which was that Christians don't take Jesus' Sermon on the Mount seriously. That we find every way we can to explain away what Jesus is saying we should look and live like in the Sermon on the Mount, to find all the caveats. And Martin Lloyd-Jones said it like this, If only all of us were living the Sermon on the Mount, men would know that there is dynamic in the Christian gospel. They would know that this is a live thing. They would not go looking anywhere else. They would say, here it is. And if you read the history of the church, you will find it has always been the men and women who have taken this sermon seriously, who have enfaced themselves in light of it. You remember that language, standing in the light of what Christ reveals to us, to be exposed and seen as who we are. It's those who stand in the light of it that true revival has come. And when the world sees the truly Christian man It not only feels condemned, it's very easy to condemn people. It is drawn. It is attracted. Let us then carefully study this sermon that shows, claims to show us what we ought to be. Let us consider it that we may see what we can be. For it not only states the demand, it points to the supply, to the source of power. God gives us grace to face the Sermon on the Mount seriously and honestly and prayerfully 
until we become living examples of it and exemplifiers of its glorious teaching. And so this sermon is what I'm going to preach or teach tonight. I am simply going to spend the remainder of our time reading the Sermon on the Mount to us. And so because I want us to hear this entire sermon as Jesus preached it in one unit without breaking it apart, to sit here and let it just wash over us and confront us and challenge us. And I'm going to ask us to really take that question seriously. Do we believe Jesus is serious? It's a question that we have to pose to ourselves. There's a lot of ways that I know that any of us who are truly listening tonight will be offended by what Jesus has to say at some point. And so the question is, do we truly believe that what he says is the way of life is just that? And are we willing to say I'm offended, but he's right? And change our life to start to reflect it. And so, let me pray first. Father, our hearts can be hardened when we come into the light of Christ. And I ask you to soften our hearts. That we would both hear the calling that you have placed on us. That if we truly abided in, we know it would draw people to you. Because we've seen your son. And when your son walked according to these very things he teaches us, he has drawn millions to you. So I ask you to help us to humble our hearts, to receive these words and these corrections as words from a loving father who is bringing life to his children when they believe them. And know that you are the God who does not abandon us when we do not meet these standards but you call us to them and you walk with us into them. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. When he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the humble, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice, because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt should lose its taste... How can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Don't think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass away from the law until all things are accomplished." Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. 
For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to our ancestors, do not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Whoever insults his brother or sister will be subject to the court. Whoever says you fool will be subject to hellfire. So if you are offering your gift on the altar, and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go, be reconciled with your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Reach a settlement quickly with your adversary while you're on the way with him to the court, or your adversary will hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the officer, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out of there until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a written notice of divorce. But I tell you, everyone who divorces his wife, except in the case of sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to our ancestors, you must not break your oath, but you must keep your oaths to the Lord. But I tell you, don't take an oath at all either by heaven because it is God's throne, or by the earth because it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem because it is the city of the great king. Do not swear by your head, because you cannot make a single hair white or black. But let your yes mean yes, and your no mean no. Anything more than this is from the evil one. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't resist an evildoer. On the contrary, if anyone slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. As for the one who wants to sue you and take away your shirt, let him have your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who asks you, and don't turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So that you may be children of your father in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the good and the evil. And sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to be seen by them. Otherwise, you will have no reward with your Father in heaven. So whenever you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues or on the streets to be applauded by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Whatever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites Because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you pray, go into your private room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. 
And when you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles, since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, because your Father knows the things you need before you ask Him. Therefore, you should pray like this, Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their offense, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your offenses. Whenever you fast, don't be gloomy like the hypocrites, for they make their faces unattractive so that their fasting is obvious to people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. (laughs) I mean, if you want to read, I could... (laughs) (laughs) that's okay (laughs) but when you fast put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting isn't obvious to others but to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, Your whole body will be full of darkness. So, if the light within you is darkness, how deep is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, since either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, What you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body about more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do so much more for you, you of little faith? So don't worry saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all of these things will be provided to you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Do not judge so that you won't be judged. For you will be judged with the same standard with which you judge others, and you will be measured by the same measure you use. Why do you look at the splinter in your brother's eye, but don't notice the beam of wood in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the splinter out of your eye, and look, there's a beam of wood in my own eye, your own eye. Hypocrite, First take the beam of wood out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. Don't give what is holy to the dogs or toss your pearls before pigs, or they will trample them under their feet, turn and tear you to pieces. 
Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be open. Who among you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good things to those who ask Him? Therefore, whatever you want others to do for you, do the same for them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enters through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, and few find it. Be on your guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit. Neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So you'll recognize them by their fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, Many will say to me, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Drive out demons in your name and do many miracles in your name. On that, and then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house, yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house, and it collapsed. It collapsed with a great crash. And when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching because he was teaching them like one who had authority and not like their scribes. This is the word of our Lord. Something that none of us had lived up to. But something that we are called to strive to live like. Titus 2.14 says that he gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession, eager to do good works. And so let's take a few moments. And as I was reading over this, I'm sure there were passages that challenged you, passages that convicted you. And I want us to spend time just in prayer about that. You talking to God. Because whenever we are convicted about our sins, the first person we ought to run to is the one who can help us overcome those very sins.